Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for this invitation to participate and present on this very important event on e-government. Um, I think it's extremely relevant and timely for most mature economies like the UK, Italy, other countries, as well as developing countries, to take stock of e-government implementation, which has really raced ahead, I think, in the last decade, decade and a half. Um, of course, mature economies, such as the UK, Italy, and other European countries in the US, have a legacy of e-government projects. Um, again, we use that term to mean so many different things, ranging from so-called back-end administration for planning and development activities to using ICTs more and more to improve the interface between citizens and government, all under the guise of, yes, the new public management um, ideal of improving accountability, transparency, um, efficiency, increased marketization of public service delivery. When it comes to um, developing countries in particular, and this of course is a term that difficult to actually place, um, to give one term to, to such a, a great range of different countries, this ideology of accountability, transparency, etc., gets coupled or linked to important and complex issues of human development. Oops. Sorry. to important considerations of um, human development. And the measurement of that linkage between improved e-government practices and human development, again, tends to be measured in many different ways. Typically, how many e-government services are being provided, um, what's the network coverage in the area or the region that you're talking about, um, and including particularly the criteria of access, um, often couched under the term of digital inclusion. Are we closing the divide between those who have access to technologies and those who do not? And e-government is perceived in the context of many developing countries as being a good catalyst or a good promoter of bridging that digital divide. So I thought I'd spend the next 15, 20 minutes talking a little bit about, um, again, it's wrong to say the whole of India, but talk, talk about a little bit about my experiences with um, looking at uh, e-governance projects, um, particularly in the rural areas of India. So in 2003, India launched its national e-governance action plan. <coughs> And a variety of different services were launched at that time, particularly in the urban uh, in metropolitan areas of the country, big cities, mainly aimed at e-services applications. The sort of payments and utility, single window type of applications became very popular in the next, in the five years that, that followed, roughly to 2008, 2009 and such systems um, continue to this day. The interesting thing uh, about many developing countries, I think, is that whereas in the UK and other European countries we assume that there's a sort of a linearity, ICTs in the public sector, good, we've automated all our departments, now let's move on to the next stage of improving interactions with citizens. In India, it's not like that typically. Many government departments are operating on a manual or semi-manual semi basis. At the same time as automation is coming in, in the back end of the administration, we also have these front end um, uh, systems, e-services systems, which are coming in in parallel, even though the back end is still manual or partially manual. Roughly in 2008, 2009, 
uh, following the, um, uh, the previous budget in the country, in India, um, there was a focus towards the rural sector, the growing disparities in the rural areas, and again, the government being perceived as a strong catalyst for promoting um, or, or for closing the digital divide and promoting development. Again, the two of them seem to complement. The perception was that if you close the divide, then this is going to um, enhance um, prospects for social and economic development. In the rural parts of the country, 2008, 2009, there was a big drive to introduce e-government projects, which continues to this day. And this was established particularly through the um, information kiosks, as they're called, or telecenters, as they're known as um, in, other, in, in some literature. It's pretty much the same thing. A small room full of five, six PCs, internet connectivity, accessories, typically run um, with the government franchising the ownership and management of these small e-government units or out, outlets, if you like, um, through a public-private partnership model. So the government would franchise to entrepreneurs, who would be public indivi uh, private individuals. In some cases, um, remember that India is uh, a very large country with 28 um, state governments. Depending on how the state wanted to manage its rural e-governance agenda, there could be involvement from non-governmental organizations as well. But in general, a PPP model was, um, was the way that, that's, um, that's been prescribed and that's been followed in the country. So, in terms of rural e-governance in India, the entrepreneur, who could be a private person you know, with some money to invest, became and has become the new interface for the provision of social welfare to citizens. Now these small kiosks would offer to the people who live within the vicinity a range of commercial and government services. Um, an example of government services would be once again the payment of bills um, to alleviate people going to different counters um, another application may be um, the, uh, the application for a government scheme. You may wish to apply for a, you're a small business person, you may wish to apply for a small loan. You could do that by going along to your telecenter, paying a small fee of a few 10, 20 rupees, getting the form downloaded, getting help from the entrepreneur, to interpret the form and to, to um, provide the necessary documentation and proof that you need to send it off and you'll be given a little counter or a token so that you know how long you have to wait. So an intermediary service was provided by the entrepreneur and that's the way in which he, he has positioned himself um, as, a, as a mediator between uh, the government and the citizens in, in, in the rural parts of the country. This has been perceived as a good way of alleviating the inefficiencies in the bureaucracy. And there has been, in general in the country, more and more of a push towards, let's say, roll back the state. Um, uh, well, the bureaucracy is inefficient in a way. Do we really need the local administrator in, in, different, in different sectors? I'll come to that in the next, in the next slide. The objective of the Indian government, in terms of rural e-governance in the country, is to establish something like 100,000 of these telecenters across the country, one serving every six villages. So, what has been the experience then of telecenters um, in rural India? Some lessons from one project uh, and we saw some images of it in the opening presentation. This is a project called Akshaya, piloted in 2003 in one district in Kerala, South India. It has since been rolled out to the rest of the 13 districts in, in that state. Kerala is unique. It has 
a very strong um, legacy or history of social development indices, political mobilization, um, a declining population growth rate. It also has, because of its effort in the social development arena, often has been criticized as compromising on the employment and economic growth and development of its industrial base. So given that, it, that this particular state in India had got a problem of economic productivity and growth, the government in Kerala saw e-governance, e ICT solutions, as a solution to, uh, to increase economic productivity and maintaining its high social welfare standards. So, in the district where I was doing my research, um, which is called Malapuram district, in North Kerala, this was the pilot district chosen, not by me as a researcher, but chosen by the state government as the one where rural governance would first be piloted because it was socially and economically backward, because it was extremely highly densely populated, the most densely populated state, uh, district in the state, um, and because it had the unique characteristics of um, lots, of, lots of people migrating, migrants going to Gulf countries to, um, to earn money basically for low, low paid clerical and manual work, leaving behind a large population of women, also a Muslim dominated uh, district. They put in place a business stroke social model for their telecenter implementation. Given its history and given its strong political mobilization, the trigger for this project came from local politicians. A hundred local MPs in the district, small district of, uh, of Malapuram thought that the way we can improve our social and economic indices was through education. They then sent that demand to the district headquarters and said that we are willing to put a portion of our budget into educating our population. And they perceived education in two ways. IT literacy, basic IT, IT literacy, and general literacy. The state government of Kerala thought, yes, interesting, there is a demand. What can we do with that? They converted the demand from the local uh, politicians into this telecenter public-private franchise initiative. They said, you can do your education and training through the telecenters. Because remember that the state government was, um, was influenced by the central government in many ways and the, the global community with its modernizing government agenda to, uh, to take on board e-government projects. So that kick-started um, the selection of entrepreneurs Local politicians had an extremely strong, strong say in who the entrepreneurs were. They were selected because of their um, social connections in the village. They were carefully handpicked, so that they weren't only commercial experts, but they had um, a, a strong affinity and respect from within the community. The centers in Kerala, the telecenters in Kerala, because of its history, were um, chosen to ensure there was a critical mass, so anyone could walk within three kilometers to the center, trying to satisfy the concern for digital um, inclusion and access. It's no use having a center if you can't even afford to take a bus and, 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 go, and go to the center. There were 630 centers when the project was launched in 2003. The project has now been running for about eight years, and there are currently 2,002 centers, sorry, 212 centers. Why the decline? One of the reasons for the decline was that the centers which have survived have been the ones 
to ensure that they are not only financially sustainable in terms of getting revenue for services, but that they are socially sustainable. Meaning that there is a close connection between the entrepreneur, the local government administrator, and I'll come to, to the connection with the local bureaucracy in a second, and the local politicians. Where that relationship um, falters, those centers have pretty much closed down. What are they doing in these centers today? 50% of the activity or revenue comes from training, mainly ICT training, how to coordinate the mouse, how to use the mouse, basic spreadsheets, word processing packages, etc., and language skills. In a place like Malabrum, it's English, it's Arabic, it's Hindi, whatever is needed. 20% of the revenue, roughly, comes from the, the facility to pay your bills through these centers. The other 30% of revenue or services is a mix of browsing, people coming in to speak to their husbands who are working in the Gulf, assisting citizens to apply for government schemes, as we were saying earlier, and increasingly a service which has nothing whatsoever to do with ICTs. Using the telecenter as a social space for congregating or assembling the large community of small and marginal farmers in that district. This is a farming district. So they would come together, use the telecenter as a, just a social, social space, and that's the, the situation in which the local agricultural extension officer, who would be a, a person who is familiar with farming, um, uh, linkages needed for the small farmers, like fertilizers, marketing outlets, diseases of crops, which are so context specific. That person would come to the telecenter, they would have weekly meetings, and this is a source of revenue for the entrepreneur, but more than that, it's something that's useful for something like 70 to 75 percent of the population of this district. from Akshaya, I've been going backwards and forwards to that project site for the, for the last several years. Yes, it's true that the entrepreneur in this new public-private partnership model is an important catalyst. He's the front end, the citizen comes in, he's the interface with the government. But it's also extremely clear that the role of local government officers um, is extremely paramount. Just three very quick examples. Through the Telecenter project, they tried to introduce a health mapping experiment a few years ago, whereby the entrepreneur would go around door to door and ask people, when you run up the hill, do you, are you breathing heavily? You know, what are your ailments? Trying to diagnose all in the spirit of improving health of the, the population. It didn't work because it was done through the entrepreneurial services and, and his um, um, extra hands that he would employ, but not through the local health officer. Another example is trying to use an e-platform for, um, uh, for providing prices, up-to-date prices and information about marketing outlets to these extremely small and marginal farmers who have only one crop, one or two crops, and they are locked into the local market. It is absolutely no use for them to know which are the best prices further down the road. The, e, the web-enabled e-system, which is implemented in the telecenters in, in Malapurum, is pretty much dysfunctional. What does work, though, is that small club that I, I was mentioning, where they get together um, and, and sit together and discuss that we have a sm small problem with our beetle leaf crops. Can you 
you know, and that, that context specific information can only be provided by one person, and that's the agricultural extension officer, and he is a local bureaucrat. So, from my point of view, it is impossible to conceive of rural e governance um, initiatives through Akshaya, and this I, I'm sure is a generalizable point, by doing away or reducing the role of the local bureaucrat. As well as the, the role of the local bureaucrat, we often hear in policy briefs, yes, corruption in developing countries, of course we can use ICTs to disintermediate, to reduce that corruption, because we don't need the local politician. With this project, the local politician was absolutely paramount right from the beginning when we had the hundred local MPs uh, you know, making the demand for the project, choosing the entrepreneurs, supporting um, the project through the variety of different village meetings which are held in the rural setting of a country like India, um, identifying relevant activities, it's only through the village meetings which have got no connection with the e-government agenda that um, the, uh, it's possible to identify what is needed at a point in time. And also coordinating informal groups. There are very many self-help groups in a, in a poor country like India, although at one level we might think that this country is doing incredibly well in terms of economic growth rates, there is also dire poverty and glaring and growing inequalities. So self-help groups are many, these are small groups, 10, 15 um, ladies who are typically below the poverty line. The coordination of these informal groups only take place in the local political village council. They do not take place in any e-forum whatsoever. So drawing implications for rural e-governance implementation in developing countries, if I can be so bold as to draw, Implications number one, I think that we have to understand governance as something that's dynamic, of course, because it's to do with a relationship, a very close relationship between, in this case, the local politicians, the local bureaucrats, the entrepreneur, and the citizens. The sustainability of the project, not only in financial terms, but more importantly, socially and politically depend on the relationships over time between these players. And sadly though, through these last eight, nine years, even today when we're talking about monitoring and evaluation and learning from the experience of projects like this, when I last went to Malapuram in August, um, I, I was you know, I was asking the monitoring and evaluation team who are based in Malapuram district, how do, how do you go about, you know, looking at this project over time? But the centers are graded on the technical profile of the entrepreneurs, even though there's historical evidence that the centers who close, which close down are the ones which do not um, have, have this close um, social and political connections. Even though that exists, it's still the case that monitoring and evaluation is done based on the technical profile of the entrepreneurs, based on the number of services that they um, offer to citizens, and based on the quality of, of broadband um, that exists in the center. It remains to be seen whether or not a new type of monitoring and evaluation or learning um, system is put into place. Thank you very much.